Hi, thanks for coming. My name is Debbie Kelly. I'm with the Missouri Alternative Center. Also, I work with small farms, beginning farmers, and also I'm the SARE coordinator, one of them, for the state of Missouri. I'm going to be moderating this session, and I'm very happy to present you with some students from Maplewood Richmond Heights Middle School who have going to be presenting aquaponic farmers building a new interest in satisfying the appetites of the future. And so I'm really excited to hear what these young people have to say about us and farming. So guys, go ahead. Hi, my name is Bill Hensky and I'm actually their uh, science teacher and I'm kind of filling in for their principal today who was kind of the impetus for this project. And um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background first on our school district and our school and why we're doing some of the, the things that seem strange to some people, why we're doing those as a regular part of what we do every day. Switch one. The next one. So, um, this is a map of where our school is relative to us. We're in that little, uh, little blip out where St. Louis is, and from St. Louis we are right on the outside of St. Louis. So we're an urban core uh, suburb. We're totally surrounded by development and housing. There's no open or green space uh, save small city parks. Um, and uh, MSD right-of-ways where they've kind of taken property for stormwater management. So opportunities for our students to get outside have always been really limited, and they've always had a really um, urban kind of childhood where they have experiences that uh, consist of playing on, in streets and yards. There's not a lot of a country experience. So uh, about 12 years ago, our school was one of the failing schools you might have heard about if you were anywhere in the country in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, test scores were really bad. Attendance in our high school was down under 200 from a capacity of 400. Uh, a lot of the kids who lived in the district would not go to school there. Parents would not send their kids to our schools. Um, and for good reason. The test scores were terrible, the facilities were really bad, and morale was really low. The curriculum that we were using in school was pretty much the same curriculum they had been using for since the 1950s. Really old school, um, really old facilities, really low morale with, with not just the students, but also the teachers, the parents, and we really had no connection whatsoever to the community around us. Um, when we talk about that nowadays, we talk about the sustainability of a system. Um, our school system was not sustainable at all. And uh, what happened is we had to come to a decision and decide what we were going to do with the school system. We knew we weren't serving the kids, we weren't serving the community, so either we were only serving ourselves or we weren't serving anyone. And what happened is a lot of community leaders came together and they decided that they weren't going to just give up. And they decided to totally revamp the way that we did things. Um, the first thing, one of the first things they did is they decided each school in the district needed to have uh, a metaphor, an underlying understanding of the way and why we did the things that we did. And the middle school, which we're all a part of, uh, became a school as expedition. And what that meant was the classroom wasn't going to be confined to that building. Um, it wasn't going to be confined to that neighborhood. It wasn't going to be confined to that community. It was going to be the entire world. If we wanted our students to get out of school and go places and be um, full partners in the society that we were telling them that they were a part of, we had to give them the training to do that. They had to practice doing that and they had to understand the kind of connections that they could have to the world around them. So along with that metaphor, we came up with four cornerstones that the, the, we, t we teach within our school. Um, the first one is stewardship and responsibility. And uh, you'll kind of see as we get into some of our programs how a lot of these connected up together. Now the purpose of, of these was to get a unifying thread throughout the whole school. And it, and it, could, have been, it could have been something else. Um, to be perfectly honest, we had nothing before. So by going to school as an expedition, it gave something to hang everything on to. So when we start to talk about the programs and then down the road aquaponics, we're really talking about how do we do education in a meaningful way? How do we do education in a way that 
connects what we're doing to what needs to be done in the world around us, what the challenges are that people outside of the school are facing, what people perhaps even on the other side of the world might be facing. So um, we have a series of what we call enduring understandings. The first is that as stewards of our world and resources, we impact the future. What we're trying to help students understand, and even as we ourselves are coming to understand it, we're responsible for the world that we live in. We don't, bar, we don't, we don't just live in it as uh, witnesses. We, we don't just go there as contestants or as uh, visitors or uh, watchers. We're an active part in controlling what goes on. And so by creating this mentality and fostering this metaphor, the students and the teachers and the parents all can really see how the school and what we do there connects in a real way to the world around us. Okay. Um, one of the really nice things about our school district is the fact that we are a truly diverse community. Um, with that, it, there's always a lot of challenges that come from diversity. You have a lot of systems that are coming together that weren't necessarily made to fit together, and we'll kind of talk about some of these challenges. Uh, when we talk about how are we going to create real life experiences in an institution that's been built to be homogeneous for a long time and managed to be homogeneous for a long time to give everyone f equal and fair services over a long time, we have to kind of pull apart some of those things to actually get things to work the way we need them to in, in the 21st century. So um, our enduring understanding about diverse perspectives providing opportunities, it's really just a statement of the fact that this is a really good and strong thing that we have. And diversity could be the, the best thing that we have. And even though it causes or presents challenges to us, it's the diversity itself that makes us particularly special or unique. And so um, this is yet another thing, though, that we decided as a, a school district and as a community, we're going to look towards to draw our inspiration and our strength from. Thanks. Um, and then the, the last was collaboration um, and community. Collaboration, if anyone's familiar with uh, 21st century skills, um, these, are, these are concepts about what it is students in growing up in this century, uh, being educated for jobs that haven't been created yet, or in some cases even imagined yet, are going to have to be able to do. Um, and collaboration with teams, working together and communicating is going to be one of those, those really big skills that are essential to be successful in the 21st century. So um, underneath each EU, we have some essential questions. And these are the, the kinds of concepts that we want students to be able to talk about, not just at a student level, but you can tell they're, they're really grown up big questions. These are things that we want students to be able to discuss with each other. And they're things that don't always have one answer. There are things that are really broad questions that are going to come from having lots of different and varied experiences um, that traditional schools really weren't providing. Thanks, Will. Um, so changing an entire school district and all the inertia that goes with having this really old organization that's been working the way it has been for a long time requires a little bit extra movement to get that going. And this was, has probably been the most questioned part about the way that we've done things and the way that we've kind of turned around our own school district and the way that the people around us see us and the way we're treated with com by community members and, and, and uh, community partners. And that is, how did you get the change to go? How did you get from something with a whole lot of institutional inertia, like a really traditional old school district that's been doing the same thing for a long time, how did you get to move? Um, and there was that philosophy that I just told you about. So first building that philosophy and making those connections to it and then saying, OK, now this is what we all agree to. We all agree that learning is to be done for and in the real world. And those connections that students make have to be to something real, to something that's going to affect their lives. Um, so that's kind of the basic background for the sustainability programs that we have and then the aquaponics program that we'll talk about in a little bit. So within our students, so we had a long tradition of 
not doing a great job at, at allowing students the opportunity to become the leaders that they are. So the purpose of bringing our, our students here today is to give them another opportunity to be in a leadership position. They know more about aquaponics than I do. They know more about uh, quite a few subjects actually now. Uh, Jamie knows more about bees than me, for example. So um, they're going to they're gonna talk a little bit about aquaponics in a few minutes. and. Um, and I want you guys to feel free to ask them some questions. A lot of this stuff has actually come from student, student questions and student interests. So some of the programs may seem non-traditional, but it's, they're really geared towards meeting the needs of those, those students as they kind of fill into those leadership positions and see the needs that are in the world today. Um, one of the major paradigm shifts in the way that, that we've been teaching uh, to kind of get students to that understanding is, is a process called systems thinking. This is a very nonlinear approach to thinking about problems, whether they be mathematical, scientific, writing and reading, or broad social problems. So um, as, as we've kind of gone through... And that, I had just sent a couple texts to my principal about what breed he wanted, and he has not responded yet. So I think he's picturing us bringing back all these chickens in the school minivan and uh, what that's going to look like. Um, but that's the kind of experience that the students are used to, and they, they see no problem with that. They see no problem with asking the questions why, and it kind of comes from the, the process of the way that we give instruction um, the instruction is, is not top-down at all. The students are part of that instruction. So um, this graphic, it shows a reinforcing loop. A reinforcing loop is where one variable is actually, when it increases, is causing an increase in another variable, which then goes back and feeds back into the original variable. So what we've actually created is a reinforcing loop in education where the students now are actually reinforcing their own learning. They're reinforcing their own development and leadership. Okay. Um, I'm going to let uh, Ms. Breed, our garden coordinator, and um, she, uh, she has a really full title, which I'll let her explain. She, and, she, <laughs> and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the sustainability programs. Hi, uh, my name is Melissa Breed Parks. And um, yeah, I am the seated table garden coordinator. So, um, you know, one thing, we've been talking a lot about sustainability in a lot of different aspects in our school and trying to put those all together in a really practical way. Part of the expeditionary learning is, is about learning hands-on, kinesthetic learning. It seems like a lot of people learn that way and a lot of schools haven't taught that way. So we're trying to get our kids out and actually doing stuff. So um, one thing is our, our school has had the seed to table program for I think five or six years now. And so that has encompassed starting gardens at all of the, you know, from preschool and, and until last, this last spring we built our final garden in high school. So preschool, elementary, middle, and high school all have gardens now. Um, we try to serve fresh, healthy food at our school lunches as part of the program. Um, two of our schools have chickens, and our middle school is getting kind of a small backyard-style chicken coop and doing research into, um, you know, keeping a database on chickens in the neighborhood. So Maplewood, Richmond Heights is an urban area, but it's becoming a very popular thing to keep backyard chickens. So, you know, there's about, a, I think, a four chicken limit. So we're keeping a database of, of and we have uh, students called chickenologists that are learning how to steward the chickens and also teach people how to keep them in their backyards. Um, so, if, you know, um, so we have, the, this is our middle school garden. Um, and so, yeah, this garden has been there for, I think, five years. It's the, the soil fertility is really high. Um, we just last spring built an herb spiral. To, to, is a kind of a demonstration about um, microclimate and a lot. It's kind of a, it's a permaculture idea, but just talking about, like, you know, the, some of the Mediterranean herbs, like it higher where it's a little bit more dry and it gets more sun. And then some other herbs would be in the back. There's a little pond. And so the water condenses as it, you know, the lower down you get. So just to kind of teach some little small things, we have little spots for that. 
Um, and this, I can't see very well, but, you know, just um, we've been planting, like working on do, planting, interplanting different crops together. Um, we have uh, some blueberries along there. And this summer, you know, was record heat, but we had a ground cover of sweet potatoes, which really helped keep the soil cool for the blueberries. So this, this garden here... Um, was really productive, really beautiful. It was south facing, so we grew all things that love the heat and tolerate drought. And in the back there, there's some orange flowers. We, we um, do a lot of integration with all of our different classes, our core curriculum classes. So for instance, um, like the sunflowers, um, bring in pollinators. So every year, Mr. Hensky has done a, a study with his, his students where they'll watch a flower for five minutes and, and count how many times it's visited by a pollinator. And so over the years, we can keep data on you know, which plants bring in more pollinators and which pollinators do we have in our gardens. And we actually, we'll talk about our bees pretty soon. We have several beehives at our school. Um, and like I said, it offers an opportunity for kinesthetic learning. So there's, you know, we have an after-school garden club, and also we're out there in different classes, like in the seventh grade science class this year, we did a study on the soil food web. And so we actually dug a, a small hole, and each classroom had their own spot, and we, they picked out all the macro invertebrates with tweezers and counted how many they had and worked on their data tables as something they're learning beginning seventh grade science and how to present their data. Um, and then just talking about how the soil is alive and how that incre creates fertility and helps feed the plants in the garden. So just kind of tying it all in together. There's a, another unit we're doing um, for our social studies class. George Washington Carver was a native of Missouri. And so we're doing kind of a history talking about him. We've grown really amazing crops of sweet potatoes this year. We had about 200 pounds of sweet potatoes with our dry hot summer. And we also grew peanuts for the first time. So those were two of his specialty crops that he found about 200 uses for. So we're going to be looking into that as kind of um, the beginning of an ethnobotany, like cultural uses of plants, and have kids discover their own cultural uses from their cultures of what plants they use, and looking at different plants in supermarkets, what, in different products. So that's how we're kind of tying things in. And then um, just recently we started growing mushrooms. We're growing um, shiitake or oyster mushrooms. We were growing them, and here we're starting in um, newspapers, phone books, and old textbooks, which I'm not sure how well it's going to work. But we'll see. <laughs> but the, the, yeah, the newspaper ones seem to be doing really well. Um, they're all colonized by mycelium, and then we have a few logs, mushroom logs, in the garden also that the kids drilled and, and um, inoculated with dowel plugs. So, um, yeah, if you want to move on. Yeah, do you want to talk about the bees, or can we keep, I can keep talking? Yeah. yeah, you want to talk? So, I'm going to talk about the bee program that we have at our school. Um, we have three hives. We used to have four, but one of them wasn't doing very well, so we combined it with another hive. So now we have two regular-sized hives and one uh, pretty big hive. And um, uh, we also started a top bar hive, which was, it, it, with these beehives, there's a frame. It's a rectangle, a wooden rectangle with wax uh, in the middle already. Um, and the bees just build off of that. But the top bar hive, it's just a bar and a little bit of wax on the top of the bar, and the bees can just um, make their wax off of that and build it however they want. And uh, they, they kind of all died at once. And um, so that one didn't work very well. But everything else uh, has been doing really well. We've gotten lots of honey. We've been selling it uh, as our Blue Devil Bee honey. And we've been making um, chapstick and other stuff with it. That, um, that's more marketing I'm with production. And uh, we also have a viewing hive in our building, which, which is, yep, right there. And um, it has, it, it's glass, so you can look at the bees and see how they're, you know, doing what they're doing and look in, it's for observation. And um, also the window that goes, we were going to drill a hole through the wall, but uh, they didn't like that. So we drilled the hole through the window and we needed to get some strong windows or else just sawing through the glass would shatter the entire glass. So we had to get new windows and um, it work, that's working as well. We're not going to be harvesting from that hive or else we'll release bees into the entire school. <laughs> and um, we've, yeah. 
Those are bees. <laughs> All right. Oh, so. I'll, oh, I can jump in. Okay. Oh no, that's that's all you. Oh, that's okay. all you. Oh, um, well, so we have, we've been working on a lot of uh, different community outreach and community connections. These are photographs from um, a project that we've done a couple times now, where we partner with a restaurant in our town and take and donate some of our produce to them, and in exchange they will do a demonstration of cooking. So we're bringing down our produce, we have leeks and carrots and stuff, and then we were, we, um, the chef taught us how to make pickles. Last year we brought our sweet potatoes and we had a big feast of sweet potato crusted catfish on a bed of our greens, was sprinkled with deep fried kale, and the kids still ask me about that. They really liked it, so if you want to get kids to eat kale, all you have to do is deep fry it. <laughs> but um, so we've also done, um, like we've this year we started selling at the farmer's market, the kids, so learning about economics, like Jamie was talking about with some of our bee products. Learning about how, you know, just, okay, so we have a product now, and learning about um, sustainable economics, the triple bottom line. Like, how, how do we um, not only make a profit, but also protect the planet and help people? So it's the social, the economic, and the environmental aspects. Um, let's see, what's next? Oh, and then um, um, we also have a kitchen um, where we can do practice cooking some of our things. We had a camp this summer where we had a gardening and cooking, and in the cool morning we would go and work in the garden, harvest, and then learn how to cook our actual, you know, the actual things that we grew. So that's another thing we've definitely seen, that kids, if they are actually growing the, the vegetables themselves, they're much more likely to eat them. So nutrition is something that our whole district has focused on. Um, we've... Uh, have our cafeteria. We have a chef for our district, and our cafeteria has been focused on serving healthy school lunches for a number of years now, and it's it seems great. I mean, the our, the food that we serve is real food. You know, we'll have roast chicken and greens and sweet potatoes, and you know, we'll have like a real meal. And it also seems like you know, not only is it's getting kids used to eating healthy food and how to you know, with the teen kitchen, learning how to prepare it, but you know, our attention in the afternoon is much higher than if they just ate junk for lunch. So it's definitely been a really big success. Yeah, we could. So we kind of talked about um, the way that we do instruction. And um, one of the things that we had decided is we wanted to get kids kind of a jump on understanding sustainability and how it relates to the different subjects because ultimately we want them to be citizens in a sustainable community. We didn't want them to do really well in school and then move to a better community or we wanted them to be a part of that thriving community and we wanted to everyone to kind of come up together. So one of the things that we worked on is creating a sustainability class and this is one of those things where you, you're really, I was really excited. This was my class. It was super awesome. It's going to be everything I wanted. And then I realized I can actually do this with every single class. Um, so this is kind of on the, on the way out, where I, we've actually grown beyond this need to have a sustainability class, because so many of our classes now are in, in, integrating the concepts of systems thinking and kind of thinking about putting these different systems together, whether they're economic, social, political, et cetera. Um, and it's kind of gone into this kind of thinking has gone into all aspects of school. So um, the next, this slide is is my my fun thing now, which is called Adventure Club, and it's basically, hey kids, what crazy thing do you want to try to do? And you'll notice they're really heavily based on outdoor experiences. This is what kids want to do. Rarely do the kids say, can we just sit inside? When you ask them, what what do you want to do for an adventure? This is what they want to do. Um, this has kind of gone into a summer class that kids kind of fight over now to enroll in, which is a unique experience for any teacher when you're in middle school and the kids are, are arguing with each other about the last spot in the class. And this class is field study, which is a science class that just happens to be all in the field. There's very little classroom time. There's still lots of work. It just has to be done on site. Um, like real field biologists, real geologists. And this is a blast to teach. It's one of my favorite times of the year. Um, in other classes, we have um, specific projects that have something to do with, with um, 21st century challenges, like our, our need for new energy sources. 
Um, so this is a project that my colleague in science did with his where they investigated different renewable energy sources and they collaborated with Washington University to um, put on different demonstration projects and then ultimately to put together a, a calendar project that was really cool. Um, but even in PE, we are looking at the sustainability of our community in terms of creating uh, people who are in shape and healthy, um, not just through eating, but also by having healthy uh, habits and, and healthy interests. So um, getting all the kids swimming and safe in that respect, getting kids out hiking and biking and things like that. So kind of building that idea of sustainability in the community into all the areas of study. Um, one that has to probably be mentioned about our school too is the um, solar panels. This is a huge community partnership now. Um, and be, because of the work that we do with sustainability and, and the fact that our students are so often advocating for their own school, we get a lot of attention from business partners. And this is a business partnership through Microgrid, which looks for investors, corporations who can uh, buy the solar panels, depreciate them, and then donate them to us after they've depreciated the cost. So it's a really neat program that's allowed us to venture into alternative energy. And this is now a learning uh, opportunity for all the students. They can log in on any day to our solar panel system, and they can look at how much energy we're creating or not creating. Um, and in the case of we have a fairly sizable solar grid, but it's enough to run our kitchen, which is another big learning opportunity. If, if that's what we need to run our kitchen, what are we going to need to run our whole school or, or keep living the way that we do? So um, this will be the last slide, the first half. And then if you have questions, you guys can um, come up and the kids or us can uh, answer. And then we're going to talk specifically about the aquaponics program. So you want to go to the next slide? So this is kind of where we're going for the, the future of our program. Um, getting the sense, not just with it, the school, but with the community that we're in and, and our business partners and community partners, um, this, the sense that this, the, the kids are a commons, society is a commons, everything is a shared resource that we all have a responsibility towards. Um, establishing different lenses through which we can view learning and learners. Um, Pushing, we, we have a community that is extremely diverse, not just racially, but also socioeconomically, where we have really wealthy families of professional parents, and we have very struggling families that are uh, single income or no income at all. So that pushback that we get from poverty and trying to help those kids achieve at the same level as their peers and give them opportunities that their peers have so that they can also be successful members of the community is a really big part of what we're trying to do. So um, if anyone has any questions right now, we'll take a few minutes to answer those. Sure. Did you determine why your top bar bees died? Repeat the question. Did you determine, oh, did you determine why your top bar bees died? Um, well, we didn't figure out exactly why they died. We think it's probably pesticides, because uh, that is one of the leading causes in death for bees. And also, they were all dead, like, just dead, while they were just moving around. There, there, there's bodies of bees crawling out of their cells, and uh, there's also dead uh, wax moths and dead beetles and dead ants all over the place. When you took on all these projects, did you do your own research, or did the teachers come and say, this is what we're going to do and uh, teach you how to do it? Well, with a lot of the projects we did, they kind of told us what we were going to do, but they put it into our hands in which we had to do most of the work. And like with our, I have to think of an example, with the aquaponics, like we, a couple years ago, a group of people went to Sweetwater, or not a couple years ago, it was last year, but a group of children went to Sweetwater Organics, and they, it's a whole thing about aquaponics, and so the children brought it back, and the principal was interested, and so he set up like a seminar, and with the seminar, we ended up going to just, it progressed from where it was, but it's primarily left in the children's hands. Does your solar system have a central hub inverter or is it in phase? 
does our solar system have a central inverter? I haven't the foggiest idea. I can actually give you the website for it, and we can we can pull it up, and we'll look at like what it's doing, and and then you can get the website for microgrid solar. They they're really active in working with schools and making those partnerships, and they they sell solar systems. So their job is to make it simple for schools, so that the schools can have it. Make it simple for the businesses who want to do good jobs with the community partners and with schools and and help kids and and help uh, help uh, reduce our dependency on fossil fuels so um, I'll get you that information out so really 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 cool program and it's it makes something affordable that would otherwise be impossible to do on your own I mean because the initial cost is so huge okay um, let's so we'll talk about uh, aquaponics now. Um, as Lauren had mentioned that the, some of her uh, classmates had gone up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they, they were actually working on an entirely different project. They were working on what to do with this um, uh, brownfield in St. Louis City that had formerly been the pruitt Igo housing project. And they were involved in this what do you do with it now project where they are redesigning this 30 acres of what had formerly been a housing project when it was now an urban jungle with second growth trees and, and just nothing but weeds and rubble. And they took this visit to the Sweetwater Organic Place and they came back and decided that that was something that they would like to try here. So um, we're going to talk first about uh, what aquaponics is. Is this me? Okay. So one of the things that aquaponics is, is a way for students actually to be involved in that food production. Kids, I mean, if you think about it, kids rarely have a choice in what they put into their bodies. The choice is dictated to them by, well, primarily by their mother in their first few years, and then sometimes by schools, and then sometimes by happenstance or convenience. So like today, for example, when we drive here and our restaurant choices are McDonald's, Taco Bell, uh, we ha we have kind of a forced choice. So this is an opportunity to, to bring up that question of what is it that we want to do? How do we want to do things? So the reason that we kind of decided aquaponics was going to be a, a good project for kids is that it would allow them to look at that system. We're not trying to teach kids to be aquaponicists. We're giving them an opportunity to do a really in-depth investigation of a food system and the parts of that food system. They're getting an opportunity to investigate the engineering of that system, how the different pieces work together, how to improve efficiency, how to deal with setbacks and problems. And these are all really important real world things. And they also have really real world implications if you mess up, if you make mistakes. And the, we'll probably be talking about some of those things as well. Um, but it also allows students to collaborate in learning with grownups. Lauren had mentioned that when they brought it back, to the principal, he said, oh, that's a great idea. And then that enabled the kids to kind of reach out. We reached out to Lincoln University uh, for collaboration. We reached out to the Missouri Department of Conservation um, for ideas and uh, understanding how the laws worked. Um, so it, it's given us a chance to build community partnerships, too, with the students as equal stakeholders, where they're a really important part of this process. Um, I couldn't be standing here talking about this right now if the kids hadn't done all the work that they had done. Okay, um, Lauren, I think this one's you. Uh, maybe. Oh, you can just talk about it. Okay, just like the entire system, or like why? Well, like I said earlier, when we had the group of students that went to Sweetwater Organics in Milwaukee, that was, the building itself was an abandoned warehouse. And with the, with the system of aquaponics, it takes up very little space. And so if it's, pre we used a basement for one of our school buildings that had no purpose at all. And we were able to produce quite some food. Like a lot of lettuce was our most successful crop. And um, we went with a seminar after our principal had reached out to the people and figured it out. And the people who went through the seminar were able to come back and help with it. And it's part of, I'm trying to think of what to say. Well, since the Sweetwater Organics had opened the system for us, we kind of, we had the eye of what we wanted to do. And we built the system and we have the fish 
and it helps us for we like the idea of the food production in the smaller spaces and it helped us come with the idea that we could make possibly a new way to grow our own food for our school and help provide for our lunches so our school district like they said has a major impact on our community now and we'd like to take what we were talking about or like we like to take this what we're learning in schools further and so with the fact that we're going to more sustainability we hope it will rub off into our area and originally we just had we didn't really know where we were going with it and we just took it how it was coming and we just we wanted to get somewhere with it and I feel like we did so Um, so I talked about the metaphors, and, and this is kind of background and how this then relates back to when we said, when I was talking about school reform and the way that we wanted students to start thinking about themselves and how we wanted the community to start thinking about students. Um, so we have, we have four cornerstones. One is stewardship, and you can kind of see that, um, well, the kids right in front of me are, are stewards who work every day in maintaining the condition of tanks, feeding fish, taking care of fish, harvesting um, lettuce and providing it to the kitchen for them to cook or, or serve in, in the, uh, the salad line. Um, but in other fields too, like citizenship. So Lauren had briefly mentioned uh, about providing food for a growing planet. Um, this is one of the things that students are really interested in, I mean, and we all are, as the planet is approaching um, more and more, well, nine billion people by, yeah, 2050. Um, that's a lot more mouths to feed, and all of them need protein. So part of, part of the job of the students is going to be when they're, when they're out of school is to figure out how to fill that protein gap. So that was one of the, the citizenship connections. Um, but leadership, students are really interested in, in providing the, the things that they've learned to other people, providing the food that they've produced to other people, and there's nothing more satisfying to them than being able to provide a meal to somebody else, a meal that they've taken play, part in uh, growing. Um, and then finally, scholarship. We, I, I love this because they collect so much data in this. They have um, temperature probes and pH probes, and they measure the oxygen uh, content of the water. They measure the fish, and we find the average. And, and we're really only getting started and in, in using it in terms of scholarship, but it's going to be a really great part of, of science class and, and math class, too. And my math teachers oftentimes complain that they have a hard time making math connections to the real world, and that's because they need the data first. So we, we're doing a really great job of collecting data, and, and um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in just a sec. You want to, Jamie, I think you're going to talk about how this actually works. So I'm going to talk about the actual aquaponic systems. And um, so water, well, it all starts with water. The entire, it's aqua, water. The entire thing is pretty much based off water. And so we have a big fish tank filled with fish. And the water from the fish tank, well, the nutrients from the fish tank that, you know, the fish create goes and um, goes into the grow bed, which help feed the plants. And it, um, you know, the lettuce, and they grow, and it also goes into the biofilter, and um, there are little bacteria in the water, and we just have this plastic stuff with lots of surface area, uh, with little, just anything that bacteria can grow on. So that goes in the biofilter, and the new, and you know, it's already in the water. The bacteria is, and it, we're just giving it a place to live, so that it can uh, eat the nutrients and thrive off of that. And what returns back to the fish tank is cleaner water than uh, what they produced, what, what came out of the fish tank. And we also, there's fish, and then there's the plants that we're growing. And, um, you know, we need to input water and take out water. And, you know, just, it, it, it's a system. It all kind of makes itself work better. And then um, the spawning tank, which is right there, uh, we can also breed our own fish. So, um, we were just doing with bluegill before, but uh, we can also take red ear and breed them with bluegill and make purple ear. And 
they will grow uh, they'll they'll grow faster and bigger than uh, the regular bluegill fish, and that also has its own little system without a grow bed. Okay. Next. Is that you, Lauren? Okay. Well, when when we talk to other teachers and, and other schools, they they want to know well, how did you do this? And this wasn't an overnight thing. We we. We loop with our kids, and our kids are really involved, and, and that's a great thing because it would be really hard if we didn't have that trust and that relationship between students, parents, teachers, and community. Um, but we still have to build up the interest because initially a few kids know what it is, but most of them don't. Uh, so the, our principal had a, a special workshop, and kids got invited to it. And it was really interesting because they got out of class and they didn't all especially know why or what they were going to do. And he had gotten some grant money to build little mini aquaponics tanks. And so each tank had two little feeder fish and in the top of the tank it had a little tray that the pump could recirculate water through the tray of gravel and they can grow little radish seeds or sprouts in there. And uh, it would recirculate back then down to the tank. So that was the initial capacity builder. And you can see some kids on stage here doing that. We did it in the theater and made it a big production. And he actually had some speakers come in that some of the students had um, found on the internet and con uh, uh, communicated with via email. Um, they volunteered to come in and talk to the students initially to kind of get them excited about it and get them understanding what it was they were going to be doing and how. Um, this is, uh, well, Lauren said we were in the, you said we were in the basement, right? Yeah, all, all of our facilities right now are in a basement. We're kind of crunched for space, and, and we use every square inch of building space that we have in our, in our old facilities. So um, the pictures are kind of dark, but you can see what they're doing. They're, they're collecting data on nitrogen there, pH. She's measuring with the probe um, dissolved oxygen, right? And I think what she's actually doing is finding out that my chemicals in the dissolved oxygen kit were bad and weren't accurate anymore. And, they, and then we checked and they had expired. So that was a good finding for me because I had been using them all summer. So I'm going to the next one. Okay. And this is what the students are all responsible for. They are responsible for most of the ongoing maintenance and upkeep of the facilities. So. We've only been underway for about nine months. So in terms of like long term, what this is going to look like and how it's going to work, I can't speak to that exactly yet. Um, but the students are going every day and collecting data. When they do go to collect that data, they have a set list of things that they're maintaining. They're maintaining the water level. They're measuring fish growth. Um, they are uh, wiping surfaces down to prevent mold because they're in the basement. They're managing the grow bed for aphids and other pest species that can get in there really easily. Um, and they're also giving tours. They're also talking to community people who want to come down and see what's going on and, and how that's working. And uh, that's a really great opportunity for stewardship, leadership, and citizenship right there. Okay. Um, one of the nice things about this is that I said it's it's a real world 21st century thing. Um, these are some of the things that we've had to adapt to. Growing out of space. Um, in the 21st century, we don't get any more planet. We don't get any more school room usually. We don't get any more space in our community. So we're going to have to think differently about the way that we use it. Um, so this is an opportunity to to change our mental model about how food is produced, or how learning occurs, or how buildings are used. Um, accidents and learning. Ac I love, as a science teacher, accidents. But just like we talked about with the bee episode, um, when the top bar hive went dead, the question is why? And if you think about the concept of going through that process and um, brainstorming possible causes, and then investigating those hypotheses that you have, it's a real world science project. And it's something that you would actually do in real life. It's not something made up where we already know the outcome. I have no idea what happened to the top bar hive. I have no idea sometimes it, when the dissolved oxygen in the tank goes down. And it's up to the students actually to do that investigation and find out what went on. Um, we, 
aren't ahead of the curve, but riding it. I mean, there's lots of people out there doing aquaponics and, and aquaculture, and they do it a lot better than we can do it in our facilities, but our purpose isn't that. Our purpose is to make those connections and provide those opportunities and kind of let kids in on the secret that even if we were just doing it, it would be do doing just about as well. Um, they know as much as we do about aquaponics at our school. Um, there's not an adult secret that we're going to let them in on. They're all in on it with us. Um, everything that's going on, in on our, going on in our world is going on for them, too. And they're the ones that are kind of growing into it, and they're getting used to it, and they're going to be uh, addressing those challenges. Oh, Will, I think you're going to talk about uh, So the next, the next piece is how, to, how do we afford to do this as a school? So Will's going to talk about that. So when we first started aquaponics, it, the whole startup cost about $5,000. Half of it was from a grant, but the, uh, the other half we were funded by uh, SER and Gateway Greening. Uh, so, yeah. Um, because we, we started off at $5,000, and to this day we haven't, gone over six that we haven't reached six thousand dollars yet so it's on average about eight hundred dollars a year and so it's not exactly that expensive depending on how big you want the whole system to be if you uh the bluegills that we have in our tanks cost somewhere around ten uh ten cents and we started experimenting with different plants to see what plants would work the best when we're using the grow bed. And out of all the plants we got, the lettuce was the most effective. So the lettuce cost about somewhere around $1.75 to $2 each packet. And honestly, all, the, all that together, I think even though it might be a lot of money, it's a good idea because kids, it, it's a good learning kind of opportunity because kids, when they're involved in something, they're a lot more attentive than if they're just sitting there listening or s taking notes. In fact, there's a quote from Ben Franklin. It goes, tell me, I forget, teach me, and I remember, involve me, and I learn. So especially if kids were to actually do this experiment and be hands-on they could use that uh, they could use that what they've just learned for if they want to do this system in the future or if they decide to just sort of teach their kids about it or something all right so um we have a little bit of time left, and if you guys have questions either about um, school reform or the, our sustainability programs or aquaponics setup, system, uh, data collection, anything like that, I'd be more than willing to let these guys answer those questions. Um, and I, I have a couple questions up here in case uh, you guys don't have any. You mentioned a non-ocean sourced fish meal. What do you feed the fish? Well, originally we were feeding them catfish food, but uh, some of the blue bluegills weren't eating it, and so we ended up switching to tilapia food, which you, I think we got it from pets. Where did we get the food? It's from a uh, Yeah, from basically any f fish feeding store. Um, another thing I wanted to mention about the feed is that we're working on sort of closing some of those loops. So I, I've, I didn't mention that in our school lunch program, we are composting our lunchroom waste. Um, and one thing that we found is that uh, we have vermicompost, the actual the grow bed of our plant has um, red wiggler worms in there. And we also have an outdoor system, red wiggler worms. And we found the, over the summer, the hot summer, that black soldier fly larvae had infested our compost pile. Well, black soldier flies are, have been, larva has been, um, is being developed as a pet food, a chicken food, and a food for bluegill.
So we're going to be experimenting with that. I have tried feeding into them. They ate it. <laughs> so, but we're going to be working on, on that a little bit more, on seeing that if we can actually raise some of our own food for the fish out of our cafeteria waste. So I'm kind of new at this aquaponics myself, but on the, uh, the lettuce that you grow in the grow bed, is it in the basement? And how do you get enough sunlight to make it grow in the basement? Um, yes, the lettuce is kept in the basement, and uh, we use lamps, uh, fluorescent lamps, to grow them, and we're getting uh, LED lamps, to, which will be much better. They'll have more, um, you know, light. It'll grow them faster, and it works just fine. The lamps, it, they produce, it, it is like sunlight to them. I mean, it's light, and they can grow, and they get everything that they need out of the, all, all their nutrients out of the fish tank. Have you done a cost analysis of how much it cost, bottom line, to produce one pound of fish? Yeah, we, we were talking about this actually on the way up, up from St. Louis, and, and we, haven't, we haven't produced a single pound. Okay. We, and we're okay with that, and because we're not relying on this to be producers. We're relying on this to learn about producers. It, we would really like to produce. But if we have a failure, and that's, that was my second question there, system failures are good lessons. Um, and sometimes it's the best crafted lesson. But we don't, we don't want to have system failures, and we don't want to lose fish, and we don't want aphid infestations. But it's OK for us, because instead of buying textbooks, we put our money into equipment, or we get grants to fund uh, opportunities like this. And so um, for us, it's. It, it would just be really awesome to have a tilapia or a bluegill meal one day in the cafeteria. So um, in terms of cost analysis, we're, we're probably doing it really wrong. Um, one of the things that we would like to long term do is have, for example, the, um, the grow tanks in a greenhouse where they could be the reservoir for heat that provides heat to the greenhouse in the wintertime, but then also can use natural light in the grow beds from the sun instead of LED lights. Um, but like I said before, we're kind of restricted by space, and what we really want to do is make those opportunities for students. So, um, and it gets, it, it starts to cost less the longer you have it because you, it'll, the system will grow and get bigger, and you'll have more fish. Uh, producing more fish. So the longer you have it, the better it is for cost e efficiency. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention about cost efficiency is several of the people that I've talked to who have aquaponics systems or been working with aquaponics is that it's actually more uh, cost effective for the plants. Like they're actually getting more value from selling their plants that they grow than from the fish just because they, the plants grow so fast and so f well with all that nutrient from the fish waste. My question is, how did you discover that the lettuces were the best to grow in that type of a system versus like tomatoes or cucumbers or other types of vegetables? Well, we didn't really use as many plants to start off with. We just kind of grabbed a, a handful of plants we thought might be effective and we sectioned off the grow bed and just planted them in each section and see which one grew A, the fastest, B, uh, which ones grew the healthiest and see which ones uh, which ones would be more of a long-term kind of plant than a short-term. So. And we're going to try other plants. Oh, we, we just haven't yet because we've had this system for less than a year. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today, and thank you very much for being a good audience for us and our students. And if you have any questions later on, just uh, find us. We'll be hanging around for a little while. Thank you very much.